Aloha and good evening. Welcome to the Hawaii Theater Center. I had to check where we were there for a minute. The Hawaii Theater Center, uh, it's Tuesday, so you are joining us for Tuning Up with Iggy and Dave. I'm Dave Moss, the Executive Director of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, here with our concertmaster, Iggy Jang, and I am so excited this evening. We are so excited to welcome all of you every Tuesday night. I am so excited to have Dave with me every Tuesday night. We are very excited to have our special guest tonight, composer extraordinaire, Michael Thomas Fumai. Michael, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Happy to be here. Welcome. I have been looking forward to this for weeks. We first met, I don't know, two or three months ago at this point, um, and I, had been a huge fan of, of Michael's music. He's a prolific composer. Uh, the future of, uh, in my opinion, the future of what symphonic music can and should sound like. Uh, and it has been just a joy to get to know Michael during my short time here. And we're really excited because you all are going to get to know Michael, not just tonight, but throughout the coming months with some projects that we're doing, so. Almost like a Fumai festival. Can we trademark that? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Iggy, before we get started, what's been keeping you busy lately? Well, of course, uh, there's a bit of trepidation with uh, what's uh, coming up the next few weeks. I'm sure you can... Uh, expand on that. So, um, you know, it's May of 2021 and we all feel like things are starting to spruce up, sprout up, whatever you want to call it. And so you kind of reflect to the past 12 months. You look ahead at the summer and it's all mixed emotions, you know, some highs, some lows some moments that uh, you could have lived with that, but uh, you grow with the times that you live in. Starting us off on a, a very deep note this evening. We have Michael, a- sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Be, be, before Dave starts on his monologue. Michael, how, how have you uh, uh, lived your own 12 months? Um, you know, for a composer, uh, Isolation is a composer's dream in some way. You know, there's uh, so much time to write. Um, I kind of, but it kind of felt like a, an episode of The Twilight Zone. Um, one particular episode where there's a character who loves to read books. Um, he finally gets a chance to read all the books he can because he's the last person on earth and um, he has access to the Library of Congress. But you know, while walking down the steps, uh, his glasses break. And so he can't read any of the books. And it's sort of like how this uh, 12, uh, last 12 months have been. Wow. And so much time to write, but um, no performance of those musics. Right, and, and you, you think of, I don't know, Johannes Brahms and he's walking um, on the side, on the border of a lake, and that's where he finds inspiration. Um, so you're isolated, and the only thing you can do is compose, but, um, have you been able to take walks or where, well, we'll get into it later, but uh, any sources of inspiration, nature? You know, I'm, I didn't really go out for walks at all. Um, I think I had a record for staying indoors and for about almost seven months, not stepping outside. Seven months. Less is last Same year, month. yeah. And, um, you know, I, a huge, fan of movies so uh, it was all the time uh, that I could to watch um, my kind of bucket list of films that I always wanted to watch and to um, watch all the TV shows and str on the streaming networks because I never had the time for so I think a lot of the inspiration has come from from that those storytellings um, so again I think with the the pandemic out there was a lot of things that were closed down, but other opportunities arose to explore. And 
um, I'm certainly gr grateful for uh, the time for it. So today is May 4th. And if I see one more social media post about Star Wars, I might lose my mind. But I remember when we first met and we were talking about your early composition interest, I believe you had a story about Star Wars. So I will let this pass. One more Star Wars story for today. <coughs> um, because the question I always ask is take us back to the beginning. And usually we let you decide, but I clearly just made that decision for you. Well, um, yes, at the beginning, so the crawl, the crawl begin. Um, I love watching movies, and I love the music in the movies, and yes, Star Wars was a huge influence in the kind of music that uh, I love to listen to and continue to listen to. I mean, John Williams is still my, I think, my favorite composer, my, the role model that I still look up to, and all of his new films that have come out recently, I'm always really impressed. Uh, uh, with the music and you know so growing up I'd, I'd love all kinds of movies science fiction movies um, Robocop was a particular favorite <laughs> even though it was really uh, bloody and violent and I, I really enjoyed the music that you know accompanied this character and um, you know it's pre high school or I say pre middle school is um, it's all I really did was to really kind of watch movies, collect movies, and um, I was a consumer in some 100% of the sense. You know, I, I played a lot of video games, and that was my my interest really. And um, when I got to middle school, uh, the opportunity arose to learn to play a musical instrument. And I come from a musical family. My, my mom is a pianist. My sister was also a pianist, and she also played clarinet in, in high school. And so uh, right when I was about to enter uh, Kawananakoa Middle School, uh, my sister took me down to her high school, uh, McKinley, and took me to the band room and let me try out instruments. Because I think you know, it was, they felt like it's important that I have something uh, something to keep me focused in life. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be a, a total slacker. Um, and so I tried out the, the clarinet, the trombone, uh, the horn. I was able to buzz a few on the instruments. And, you know, it's, I, I didn't really, you know, latch on to it that much. And so my, my pediatrician at the time also said, Michael, you should sign up for band because you have asthma. And, you know, mm. if you want to build up your lungs, play a wind instrument. So I signed up for band, but for some reason I was placed in orchestra. And to this day, I don't know why. Um, but so I was in uh, Dan uh, Daniel Mew's orchestra class and looking at all the instruments, and this is not the band, okay, but you know, I've seen violin on TV. I've seen people play the violin on TV and I've heard the music that comes from it. And it's always really like pyrotechnics when they play that really fancy kind of music that I'm hearing. I want to do that. So it's also the smallest instrument of the string family. So I chose the violin and I- I'm sorry, middle school? So how old is that? I was about uh, 12, 12, 12 okay. at the time. And so I brought the violin home and uh, to, the, to my sister, she, she looked at me and said, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's- um, What was she hoping for? I think she was hoping for a clarinet because that was her instrument. Um, but you know, you know, learning to play a string instrument, it's, there's the growing pains of the sound. I mean, it's not particularly pleasant learning how to, to play. And, but you know, I fell in love with it um, immediately. And that's when I started to uh, really focus in on looking for music to perform. And you know, I, at the time, uh, Amazon had just, uh, well, they had just started. And they were just selling books, but I was like looking um, on the computer for like CDs and things that, you know, hear the samples of music that I could possibly like, wow, this sounds really cool. And it was like Christmas every, every day exploring something new. Um, and it's a, it's a time that I offered and remember because when you think about, you know, what for, for all of us, when we think about Beethoven, for instance, what was it like for us to listen to Beethoven for the first time? And so I, I remember listening to all of these classical composers, particularly film music composers, um, and just being totally absorbing everything that I had. And you know, while I was learning the violin, I also started to experiment in composing. So 
Did you have a, a violin teacher? I, uh, I did, yes. What a leading question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, for the first two years at uh, Kwanakoa, uh -huh. um, Daniel Mew, okay. the orchestra director, was uh, my teacher. So you know, I basically go to class and I learned how to play. I had been able to read music before because my, uh, I had piano lessons, um, unsuccessful piano lessons several years uh, before. Um, so I could read music, and uh, it was just a matter of getting used to playing the violin, which for me was physically really difficult. I mean, it, felt, it was painful to play, even to hold the, the instrument um, to, uh, in the chin. Um, thank goodness for the chin rest. Uh, <laughs> but I remember in, in, um, during recesses at Kawanakoa, uh, I'd have a competition with my friends so who could hold the violin the longest without chin rest. Um, and so we just kind of walk around with the violin <laughs> <laughs> around the, uh, the, the room. And um, it was a fun time. And, uh, oh, okay. and so I was getting pretty good at it. And then um, I started to take lessons with Craig Young. Okay. Uh, you're one of your guests from Punahou uh, okay. was here. And um, I really enjoyed learning from Craig. And a lot of, um, a lot of learning a lot of the repertoire, standard repertoire, that's where I really learned to, you know, how to shift, um, get all the high notes that I didn't know how to get. Um, and so I, I studied with Craig until, uh, until I started at the University of Hawaii as a college student. Um, but again, I was still exploring how to, um, how to compose with a computer program um, that I, I think I, I purchased it or my, my parents purchased it at, I think it was Computer City or maybe it was CompUSA, these are stores that are long gone now. Um, brick and mortar. Brick and mortar uh, computer stores. And it was called like a sheet music writer plus. It could only write piano music. But you know, I installed it and, and said, wow, this is really fascinating, you know, just to come put in notes and hear it back immediately. Um, and so I wrote a lot of very impossible piano music because I tried to fit everything I could onto a, a grand staff. Um, and it was just experimentation and letting my imagination run, run, kind of run wild. And so I, I was looking for another program that would allow me to write orchestra music. And Sibelius had just come out uh, when I was uh, just about to start high school. And um, the program was around $600 at the time, vastly outside of my price bracket. So I found a... Uh, I used the tra uh, trial version of it, which didn't allow me to save, unfortunately. And so you can imagine the way I worked around that was to never turn the program off, uh, never turn the computer off, just to continue to write until maybe uh, I had something that I thought was pretty good and I printed it out. And I kept printing out drafts, kept printing out anything that I felt was uh, was good, and sometimes the computer did shut down by mistake, or maybe there was a power outage, or the, the sleep mode turned on and it actually turned off, and so I lost uh, music, and so for me it was having to rewrite everything over and over again. And this is the way that I had learned to compose. So before we ask you about your formal compositional training, uh, Dave, if people have questions for Michael, what do they do? Yes, you can text us in this evening. The phone number is here below. Uh, you can text us there your questions for Michael, for Iggy, uh, some questions for me if you'd like. Uh, we have some fun announcements to make uh, a little bit later in the show. But before we do any of that, can I do the quiz question now? Can I interrupt your story just briefly here? I want to thank Hosser Wines here in uh, Chinatown for their constant support of tuning up in the symphony. Um, if you have the correct answer to the quiz question this evening, uh, we have a quiz question. We do. You will get this bottle of, of wine. And Iggy, do you mind if I pronounce this one this week? Please. Uh, it is Red Car. So the quiz question is, Michael studied composition um, I will get to, into it at University of Hawaii and Manoa, as well as University of Michigan. Name 
one of his composition teachers at UH. We'll probably go over them through this conversation, but we would like you to call or rather text us and name one of Michael Fumai's composition teachers at the University of Hawaii. So not violin teachers. Not violin teachers. <laughs> <laughs> because Michael did take violin lessons at UH. And we'll get to, into, that, into that as well. So yes, please text us your answers, questions. Uh, thank you again to, to Terry. We have a, another wonderful charcuterie uh, plate from Terry <gasps> at Hosser Wines. So thank you, Michael and Terry, for your support. So back to your formal composition yes, so, training. So Michael, you were saying, so um, those computer programs um, help you write for piano and then the early versions of the trial versions of Sibelius yeah. um, allowed you to, to write as well, but where did your actual formal training start? So, um, Craig, Craig Young had, had um, in one of my lessons, had, had said, Mike, you should start to take lessons for this. And this was, I was in... Because he already saw what you did? I, he had saw what, he did, what I had did. I also had uh, done some arrangements for his Christmas concerts. Okay, and true. so he started looking it over and said, you know, let me, um, let me put you in touch with uh, a composer in the symphony. And so um, this, my first teacher was Peter Askim. He was uh -huh. a bassist in the symphony at the time. And so I had uh, gone over to his place for a lesson, and it's my first encounter with music theory because he started to um, teach me music theory, and he gave me How the. How old were you? I must have been about uh, fourteen. Fourteen. At the time. So you had some knowledge of violin, piano, and music notation software. Yes, and I also looked at a lot of uh, scores, and I was listening to. So I, I spent a lot of time in. Barnes and Noble or Borders, looking at the Dover edition scores, wow. um, looking through them and trying to and it, copying in some ways, imitating. And are you able to read orchestra scores? Uh, yeah, um, it took me a while to get used to. I'm still learning. To get used to used um, to actually using it, you know, practically. Uh -huh. But I remember, um, like for Christmas, uh, I was on the uh, Sheet Music Plus, which is a music retailer, okay. and I had at, at that time John Williams was putting out his note-for-note note orchestra suite arrangements of his film scores. I was like, I have got to get my hands on some of these. And the real, I mean, the, the real difficult versions, not the, the kind of... The real the versions that were, for, for the most part, are pretty close to the, the movie mm -hmm. score. Can we pause for a second? John Williams' music is incredibly difficult, and I don't think audiences <laughs> realize how, how the Harry Potter, for example, the violin part. Tell us what that's like when you see that come across your right, stand. Right, so... Um, <laughs> Sometimes I liken, well, I mean, they're totally different, but like some opera composer like Richard Wagner, uh, it's so difficult that you think it's a color thing, that maybe you don't have to play all the right notes. <laughs> <laughs> Although my step partner, Claire, has a fingering for every uh, note if it's like a really fast passage and like I marvel at her dedication. I'm just like thinking, oh, it's just a color thing, but but John Williams, yeah, you, um, Dave mentioning uh, uh, Harry Potter, you know, so, dun, 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 dun. but what the violins are doing is, right? And actually, we seldom rehearse that because conductors understand this is something that may come out or may not, but it's kind of the overall impression. But we did have one conductor says, can we do that slowly, please, violence? <laughs> and I don't think he's been with us ever since. But anyway, sorry, Michael, your impression of, of <coughs> why the music is so difficult and, 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 I mean, I'm sure, I mean, we do our best to play the right notes, yes. But is there more to that? Um, well, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, when I'm thinking about creating like a, a gesture that's supposed to communicate something, like, flying on a, uh, a carpet, magic carpet, or flying on a bicycle with, That's with, with an alien. Yeah, no, it's, um, I know his music is really difficult. I've had, Harry Potter has come across my music stand too. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and I remember looking at it and saying, wow, this is incredible. He, I, mean, it's, I think we hear stories about the recording session yeah. for Harry Potter and how, how amazing uh, what they did yeah. because it's so, there's so many notes. And, and, and if you're a studio musician, you don't get to rehearse at home. You, the music is there in front of you and you have one rehearsal or, and then you just record. I, I, some of my colleagues are studio musicians in LA and it's just uh, incredible. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm thinking more now about playability. Um, but I think when you know, if you have some something in mind and, and it, it involves a lot of notes, um, I think as a composer, we just kind of explore every possible way of getting it on the page or to kind of communicate. And you know, a lot of my music has been very difficult. My early pieces, impossible to play. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I see Iggy just write a, write a note right there. Playability. Playability. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I really enjoyed um, you know, looking at, at William's scores and seeing, wow, he actually really put all those notes. I, rem yes. I, I was listening to the, uh, the Imperial March from Star Wars. <laughs> from where? <laughs> no, just kidding. Yes. And there's a part at the very end where the strings are just going really fast. And I didn't have the score at the time. I just was wondering, are they really doing that? Uh -huh. um, and I got my hands on the score and said, they really are doing those notes. And it's, uh, uh, I think it's, I mean, there's things that are really hard to play. It uh, can sound very flashy, right. you know? Um, and so I think that's, I guess, that's for Hollywood film score. There's a lot of immediate flashiness that is needed. And so a lot of notes is probably very important. So tell us, uh, take us back to your first uh, encounter with uh, Peter Askin. Yeah, um, so I, I had brought a, a score that I was working on called uh -huh. The Bicycle Ride. And this would be a piece that would be later performed by the Youth Symphony a few years later. Um, but, you know, Peter Lewis was looking at the score and said, this is great, great orchestration. I can see the John Williams influence very strongly. Wait, wait, wait I, sorry, but I'm asking you about your first formal training and you already have a piece for whole orchestra before your first formal training lesson. So what, how did you learn? You, you said you wrote crazy things for piano and you used uh, the trial versions of Sibelius. Is that where you just put yeah. like 50 instruments together? Yeah. It was, it's, by the time I had met with Peter, I'd had a number of pieces already, including uh, several orchestra scores and some sketches. And it was a matter of looking at others, other people's scores to see how it was all put together. Now, there were some notational things that I did not do correct. And, you know, Peter put it out to me. So you like should put really... Pete's on, on the flute score? Uh, <laughs> putting <laughs> dynamics for one. Um, uh, and... Um, so yeah, when I so when I met Peter, he was very very like, wow, you have a lot of music. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was it was something that I I just loved doing it. It was my it was my hobby, and so I, I, any waking moment I was composing. That's why I had so much music on hand. And so you know, Peter kind of recognized this, and he recognized that I didn't have a theory background yet, so I didn't know what I to call what I was doing. And so uh, he started, he, he gave me the, the textbook that I would later use at University of Hawaii. And I looked at it, I read through it, and I said, ah, what is this stuff? Um, the terminology involved with music theory, I didn't get it. And I, I told Peter, I have a really hard time understanding what's an agogic accent. And what, are, what is harmonic function? I don't understand any of this because I don't use any of this when I, I compose. Myself, anyone, yes. <laughs> Well, I don't really use it as well when I compose still. Um, but so, and it was for one, I think one of the first composition assignments he gave me was to write a piano piece that used inversions with, uh, with triads. Uh -huh. And so I did that and um, I, I wrote a piece. But so did it, my, my guess is that you were very fast in learning, am I correct? Uh, well, I was very quick in writing music. Uh, and I think this stems from having to write music for the length of a computer, for the computer to stay on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's really quick. I, I wanted to get the ideas on the page. Um, so I absorbed information very quickly. 
But I'm, I mean, like, if, if um, Peter says, OK, we're learning about inversion, um, my guess is by the end of the lesson, you've assimilated everything. Yeah, uh, or it's, um, oh, so that's what I was doing in this mm -hmm. piece. So I, now I see why, why that sounds like that. Um, so it was kind of an eye-opening experience, like putting names to what I was doing. Um, I still didn't quite really understand music theory until, uh, I want to say, until I got to master's degree, actually. <laughs> well, that's actually good to know because a lot of uh, my students, uh, they can play tough pieces, but they have uh, glaring weaknesses when it comes to theory and solfege and ear training. So um, it's never too late to learn. We have to ask the, the Randy Wong question here. Fixed dough or movable dough solfege? Um, I, movable dough for me. Movable, okay. Yeah. That makes, I feel nauseous just thinking of a movable dough. <laughs> well, you know, for, well, I don't want to get into the semantics. <laughs> Do you of, have perfect pitch? Um, I have a relative pitch to the violin. So if I hear like an E, I can tell if it's an E on the violin. Mm. Okay. Especially if it's an open string. <laughs> Especially if it's an open string, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there'll be, there'll be moments where like, wow, that really sounds like a G if I were to play it on the violin. It okay. feels like a G, it is G. So I have that. Um, so while you were at UH, we, you had a few composition teachers. We already have a winner, so uh, we, we can talk freely. Uh, we'll announce the winner shortly here. But uh, you were studying composition. You were also taking violin lessons from, from Iggy. When, when was it composition? When did you know that you were going to go that path? And what drew you towards that? It was always composition um, my senior year in high school. Senior year, so just you were just dabbling in the violin, if you will. Um, no, I think it was both. Both, um, okay. I was, I was equally passionate about performing um, and equally passionate about writing. Yeah. Um, it was, I guess, well, yeah, the question was, when did I make the right, yeah. strong decision? Um, it was, I guess, when I had to apply for, for colleges. Okay. Um, I, I got a lot of joy out of you know, writing music, because it opened up kind of the imagination of the mind that I didn't quite get with performing. Um, but I still loved performing, which is why I still uh, took it up. It was a requirement uh, to perform. But, you know, th very early on, I knew that I wanted to be a composer. And it had to do with the, um, a reading session uh, of the Bicycle Ride, this piece that... Um, that was done by the Youth Symphony? But that was, but that, it, well, it was performed, premiered by the Youth Symphony with the Henry Mir Mora. Um, but the year before, I was also playing in the University of Hawaii Symphony. Uh, Mr. Miyamura would let me. As a uh, high school student. As a high school student. Okay. And so, you know, at the end, the last, uh, last rehearsal of the semester, uh, he said, does anybody want to read any pieces from our music library? And I said, um, I have a piece. Can, can we read it? And he said, yes, if you conduct it. And so, I, you know, I set up my video camera in the back of band room, and that was it. I was a composer, because you know the sound coming from all the instruments, it was amazing. Amazing, that was it, I already knew. You kind of uh, went over quickly about your performing uh, uh, skills, but I remember as, when you were in high school, uh, you performed the uh, uh, Scheherazade uh, as a concert master of the Hawaii <laughs> Youth Symphony, and I, I remember listening to it, and I was quite impressed. And, um, we already knew that you were, uh, you had a lot of compositions that were being performed by the Youth Symphony and, and uh, Mr. Miyamura, but, uh, and so everything you did were kind of, of, of um, high quality, um, I have to mention that now. Um, when I taught you a little bit at, at UH uh, to answer Dave's question or query, uh, I, I knew that, that your major was, was composition and I, I knew violin was important, but 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 it was uh, sort of a, to implement or supplement your your musical knowledge, and I don't know if you remember, but by the end uh, of our lessons, uh, the last couple of years, our, uh, Michael would just show up at the lessons, and I would just maybe pull up a a, a book of of duets for violins, maybe Piazzolla or others. And we would just uh, read music and until the lesson was over. That's how we spent our last few lessons together. I don't remember that, but 
Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I really enjoyed learning under you, Vicky. It was, uh, it was um, you know, I often go into lessons feeling like it's a doctor's appointment. <laughs> 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 but, but, I, but, you know, it was, I was looking forward to, uh, to uh, playing music with you and learning from you. So. Well, maybe by the end, yeah. I, I, I think at the beginning, uh, you, maybe you were a little sweaty or, I mean, you were kind of n nervous. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Um, but you know, it's it certainly I warmed up to you. Yeah, well, and, it was, uh, yeah, it was um, a pleasure to have you. And you know, yeah, it, it's it's composition was at the forefront. So I, I might not have been the best student for a violin student. Um, I don't think I practiced that much, focused more on writing. But um, I think that one of the last pieces I learned uh, was the uh, Cornigold Violin Concerto, or tried to learn it. Sure, it was so hard. But you know, I love the uh, the melodies, and um, yes. and you allowed me to to uh, uh, perform it. So and another film composer. That's another right. Film composer. Yeah. And as the New York Times wrote about you, on writing your writing is very cinematic. Well, my love for for movies still shines through. So I want to. It's it's we're halfway through the show here tonight, and um, I'm very anxious to to talk about the future, uh, and. We've hinted at it over the recent weeks on the show here. Uh, we did make a quiet announcement uh, yesterday to our subscribers um, that the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra will be returning to live in-person performances in May. Uh, our first performance will be May 14, 15, and 16 at the Waikiki Shell. I want to preface this with uh, the Waikiki Shell is outdoors. It's an 8,000 plus seat venue. Um, and our first performances in May will have 200 members in the audience and an incredibly rigorous safety protocol for not just our audience, but for the orchestra as well. Uh, we are going to be the leaders for this community as we return to live events. And I'm grateful for the support of the city uh, and the entire production industry, uh, many of whom are on stage with us currently tonight uh, and have been getting us through the pandemic uh, with all of these digital assets, which will continue going forward. But part of this is uh, the man in the middle here of our show tonight. Um, the, this is called the Sheraton Starlight Series uh, at the Waikiki Shell. It'll be eight weeks of performances, uh, two weeks in May, two weeks in June, two weeks in July, and two weeks in August. And they will be conducted by Ray Hatoda in May, Lydia Yankovskaya in June, Sarah Hicks in July, and then in August, Naoto Otomo will be joining us uh, to conduct the final program. And just before that, we'll have music of Led Zeppelin in Queen. Uh, a challenge was issued before the show, um, so I can't wait to see how that one turns out. Um, but this Starlight series on every single performance, with the exception of the Queen and Led Zeppelin performance at the moment, uh, has a composition by Michael Thomas Fumai. And Tell us, Michael, what's going to happen this summer? <laughs> well, um, I'm speechless for uh, what all of you have planned, Dave. It's, it's um, you know, a, a festival of one's music to have a, you know, a piece on a series of concerts. This is an honor that uh, we hear given to Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, composers long gone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's un almost unheard of. It's unprecedented what uh, we have planned here. So um, I guess we can go over what's on the program. Yeah, let's go over the programs. Uh, so let's start here with our first two performances in May uh, with Ray Hatoda conducting. Uh, I'll share what, what else is on the program. Uh, Mozart's Overture, uh, we have the Mozart Clarinet Concerto with our principal uh, Lou DeMartino and Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 8. And what else? And we have a piece called Becoming Beethoven. And this is a piece that was uh, originally composed for the Portland Symphony in Maine. In fact, almost all the pieces that are going to be performed will see their Hawaii premiere here. Um, and so Becoming Beethoven is kind of like a superhero origin story for one of uh, composer's uh, superheroes, Beethoven. And it's told through this, uh, it's a story that kind of tells about his deaf deafness. And, 
how he overcomes that deafness to become the uh, kind of legendary figure um, that we know him today. And so and you'll hear in this piece like a lot of, uh, not quotations, but I take fragments of all nine symphonies, just about almost nine symphonies, and put them in the piece, but I blur them uh, and distort them as if uh, the audience is in the seat of Beethoven, hearing his music uh -huh. through the deafness. And so there's a, you know, it's, um, again, it's, a, it's an origin story for uh, one of my most beloved composers. Are, are you familiar with the piece by John Adams that he wrote for orchestra and string quartet, I think? And there's some quotation about Beethoven. Absolute jest. You, you, uh, thank you very much. But this is your, your lens is much different than his. Um, yeah, so it's, it's original music. Um, and one, one example is of taking, extracting inspiration from Beethoven's music. It's like the, the opening to the Fifth Symphony. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. There are four pitches there, right? So what if I remove those rhythms? And now I'm left with four pitches, and I can state those pitches with different rhythm. I can state those pitches in different order, or combine them all together so we have harmony. So those are kind of the ways in which I've kind of extracted the inspiration to create original music. Tell us about the Hokulea Symphony Suite. Yeah, so uh, this is, um, so this, uh, the symphony pre uh, premiered uh, Reis Havaiki in 2019, Hawaii Symphony. Hawaii symphony and. Um, uh, I have a orchestra suite. It was originally scored for choir with orchestra, and so oh, sorry, this, maybe can you go very briefly about this hokulea uh, big event? Yeah, so this made? is a, a kind of big thirty-minute uh, orchestral choir symphony uh, that tells the story of hokulea um, and uh, the initial journey to kind of revive that, the, the knowledge of, of the wayfinding, oh. wayfinding, and. Um, a lot of the text that were used was the, um, the words of Nainoa Thompson and Eddie Aikau. And so it, it, was a, it was a piece that started from the beginning and ended uh, in the celebration of their uh, recent voyage, Mona uh, Honua. And so uh, that was the kind of a huge piece. And um, the Youth Symphony had wanted to uh, perform part of it. And so I put together a suite of just the orchestra, some of the orchestra movements. Okay. And actually, I had written about two hours of music. And we only performed 30 minutes of it. So there was a lot of extra music that I thought, well, let's, it's still inspired by Hokulea. So um, I put together three movements that uh, to tells the story of that first voyage from, from here to Tahiti. And that's Starlight Number Two, the second week of performances, also conducted by Ray Hatoda. And this performance will also feature one of our Nahoku Opio, our Young Stars winner, uh, Mira, will be yes. joining us uh, for the Schumann Cello Concerto. Uh, and then also on the program is Tchaikovsky Symphony Number no. Four. Um, Michael, you, I remember um, listening to Nainoa Thompson of the Hokulei. And he said that people sometimes ask him, well, you have this quote unquote old relic, this canoe, is it still relevant to do a um, voyage around the world in this canoe? And he said, absolutely. What we do is bridge gaps between all civilizations globally. Do you feel like do you feel that your own writing, you know, when you implement Hawaiian culture and tradition and non-Hawaiian culture, that your music helps bring people together? I think so. Um, I, I remember in a conversation I had with, um, with Ainoa that we talked about the relationship between, uh, between voyaging and music making, and sometimes, you know, on a surface level, you might think, "Wait a minute, is there a connection?" And but you know, there is, there is a, a strong connection. And the deeper I looked into it, um, you know, one of the things was the idea of you know, orchestra performance, composing. That's a, it's ancient, from from where we are today, right? And so it's. Um, is it, it is still relevant? Of course, of course it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it allows us to you know, keep in touch with our, our own history. Where it's always important to know where we come from 
And you know, there's there's a metaphor that uh, we talked about. I talked about with Nainoa, and that was you know, voyagers, navigators, when they are on the sea, they are guided by starlight, starlight. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that that starlight, we they look up into the heavens, and um, when we think of looking up into the heavens, of we think we think of space exploration, we think of the future. But that starlight that's shining back to us is light from the past that is guiding them to find their destination into the future. And so without that information from the past, they'd be lost. Mm. And so I think that's a very apt metaphor mm. for you know, both combining tradition with the new and uh, you know, bridging people together through an art form. Navigation is, is, is a, you know, it's a physical art form. And you know, so is music. So is music. It takes a lot of practice, stamina. Um, there is generally a leader, a navigator, just as an orchestra. Um, they have to, you know, plan out conspicuously everything that needs to go on the journey. And in some ways, that's sort of the equivalent role of a composer, planning everything out in the score for the musicians to navigate. Beautiful said. Starlight series, Dave? Number three, uh, we will be joined by Lydia Yankovskaya, a, a young uh, conductor uh, who, for this performance, will be making her de debut with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra. And this performance that we're about to talk about, uh, Starlight number three, uh, is being filmed. Um, and we've been chosen by the League of American Orchestras to actually close uh, the League of American Orchestras conference, uh, which will be uh, aired on J uh, June, excuse me, June, June 17th uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern, I believe. Um, but it's an opportunity for us to showcase uh, the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra and the it's a talented. Big deal. It, it is. It's a very big deal, and it, it was in recognition of the wonderful work that that the musicians did here on the stage of the Hawaii Theater Center in the fall of last year, uh, with the help of Donard and Bob and Greg. Sounds of resilience. Uh, sounds of resilience, and so this is the opportunity to share that on a grander scale with our colleagues on the mainland uh, and what better place to do it uh, with Diamond Head in the background and with an unbelievable program. I'm so excited about this one. Uh, this will be Florence Price Symphony Number no. 4. Uh, this will be Tchaikovsky's Hamlet Fantasy Overture, which I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, both of you. Uh, and then uh, what else do we have? I believe it's Full Metal. Full Metal. Yeah, so this is um, a piece about uh, it's inspired by an anime series called Full Metal, Full Metal Alchemist. Um, and uh, no, it's, it's, it's a series that I was introduced to as a, a college student in Michigan and absolutely fell in love with uh, the story. And you know, the story goes, uh, it's about these two brothers who um, try to bring back uh, a loved one using alchemy. But instead they open Pandora's box and unleash untold amount of uh, chaos upon the earth and the rest of the story is about them trying to right their wrongs. And so I was just so taken by this story and um, I don't use any uh, music from the series itself. It's just kind of my own uh -huh. inspiration. Okay. Um, but so the, you know, the piece is like a gigantic spell. It's the source is apprentice on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I guess you, I think the title is, is pretty onomatopoetic. There's a lot of percussion, a lot of brass, the kitchen sink is probably thrown in there. It's the kind of music that um, when, I, when I watch like an anime series, I'm just kind of bombarded with all of these images and they're loud, sometimes very violent. And so I want to kind of channel that same energy for orchestra. This saturation of colors and sounds. Yeah. Um, um, I should say that um, you mentioned that um, a lot of those pieces, the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra will have played for the first time, but I should tell the audience that uh, orchestras like Milwaukee Symphony, Philadelphia Orchestra, Minnesota Orchestra, and Buffalo Philharmonic are the other orchestras who've premiered your work. So um, it's not like, you know, we're taking things from, um, no, you know, no offense from, from youth orchestras. I mean, those are really established uh, orchestras that uh, have featured your work. Oh, yes, and that's, I think this is what I'm really looking forward to, is sharing these pieces that have been written for orchestras uh, across the nation, 
but have never been heard by my friends and family here at home. Um, and so I think there'll be some very, there's be some, some surprises for those who are very familiar with my work here and, and then comparing to the music that I've written for elsewhere. That's right. And, and I'm sorry, Dave, just one more thing is, I, I heard your work uh, that you wrote for orchestras when you were in high school, and I thought, wow, very brilliant. Reminds me of a swashbuckle, you know, um, Errol Flynn or whatever. Um, and I thought maybe a little bit of structure will help uh, when you go to training. I don't know if you think that's an insulting comment because I don't know anything about composing, but, and, but I, I, you know, I, uh, I've seen over the, the years how that swashbuckling element has always been there. Uh, just a little bit how you funnel that energy, I guess. Would you agree or am I just full of it? No, no you're, you're totally spot on, <laughs> spot on. It's, um, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, form, you know, I, I would just let, it, I was kind of like, a, you know, just let the music flow uh, and get the ideas on the page. And then you, through schooling, I try to shape all of the music into a, you know, a finer, you know, piece of art. Um, but, you know, my love for the swashbuckling Hollywood score is it's kind of always been there because I still love that to today. And, uh, um, you know, I've had many teachers that have told me to never lose that, mm. uh, that spark that got you interested about music. And yes, you know, I've gone through phases of exploring the avant-garde, uh, <laughs> experimental music, very highly dissonant music, and but I always end up back to my love of, of this, the music that I loved at the beginning. Yes, absolutely. Well, speaking of structure, <laughs> The fourth Starlight uh, performance, again with Lydia, uh, features a, a double header of Mendelssohn, the uh, Mendelssohn Violin Concerto uh, with another one of our Young Stars winner, uh, Aaron Nishi, uh, and then Mendelssohn Symphony Number no. 3, and paired with that is? Music from the Castle of Heaven. Uh, that's a uh, very poetic title. It would, it would seem that that has divine inspiration. <laughs> But it actually, the genesis for that piece was uh, very grounded. And I was in a, I was in a Barnes & Noble uh, up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, when I was still up there in 2014 or 15. And I was perusing the, the bookshelves, looking for inspiration, as I often do for pieces. And I came across this book called Music in the Castle of Heaven by John Elliott Gardner, conductor. And it's a book about the music of Bach. And I, I saw that and said, I wish that someday I can write a piece called that. Hmm. And it's actually one of the few pieces that I've written uh, that have not been for anyone. It's, uh, today, I, I normally only write on commission, but this is one of those pieces, recent pieces, that I wrote because I had to write it. And um, it is music that, uh, there is a connection to Bach, but I was so inspired by the title Music in the castle of, from the Castle of Heaven, um, I wondered what could music in the heavens be? Um, if I look up at the clouds, um, I said, okay, music in the clouds. What if I wrote a piece that was about clouds? And I think everybody can relate to looking at the clouds and seeing things that are familiar, shapes, objects. And so um, this piece is very much about that kind of... Uh, cloud music that turns into things that are very familiar. And what is very familiar in the music is, well, the music of Bach's name, four pitches that comprise his, his name in the German spelling, mm -hmm. um, but also music that is, has come to be identified with the heavens, liturgical music, Gregorian chant, all of that makes its way into this piece and kind of, um, uh, again, it's, it's very, very ethereal. Well, I'm, I'm eager to talk more and read the program notes uh, about that performance because there's so much relationship between Bach's works today and, you know, because of Mendelssohn's interest in, in Bach's choral works, especially that, that Bach could arguably be, you know, is, is who he is today to modern society. So I'm really, I'm curious to see where that goes in our conversations in the coming weeks. So.
The side uh, note to that is uh, if you're reading the program notes for our Summer Starlight series, um, they're actually written by Michael Thomas Fumai as well. So the, the, the whole program notes? Yes. So the companion pieces to Michael's works uh, on the program as well. And, you know, it's it's sort of, for me, it was this, can we get in the mind of a composer? Mm. Um, and, you know, what is, you know, how, how do you describe Beethoven's work when you've written a piece called Becoming Beethoven? Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm sure our, our audience is eager to uh, join us for that journey this summer. So um, the next performance on our Starlight series, I'm going to gloss over just a little bit because there's still some details that will come out uh, regarding that. And uh, that's actually going to be a program of music for and by the Queen, uh, a program that the symphony has done in the past, um, and we're really excited to present that, and details will be forthcoming. Um, so I'm going to skip to the next week, which must be Starlight Six. Um, Sarah Hicks will be joining us as conductor. Uh, this is American music. This is uh, Copeland, Bernstein, Tork. Uh, Slacky guitarist and vocalist Makana will be joining us. And, and what else? And a, a piece called Rat Race. Exclamation point. Exclamation point in there too. And this is a piece that actually has a history with the symphony here. Um, there used to be reading sessions with the University of Hawaii, and this was that one of those pieces. Was that Peter Askin conducting? Um, that, uh, well, not? it was first read by then Joan Landry, okay. the assistant conductor, and then uh, it was reread again, like I made revisions by uh, Stuart Chaffetz. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was under a different title, but I've renamed it Rat Race because I think it really describes the, the action in the music. It's music inspired by Tom and Jerry cartoons. And so uh, <laughs> it's a game of cat and mouse for orchestra. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and we will also have another one of our young stars on that program. Uh, Sophia Stark will be joining us uh, for a selection or two on that program. So, Michael, I wanted to ask you, uh, so if we learn an instrument, a violin or a piano, um, we usually stick with one teacher, you know, in your formative years, then you have another teacher in college. But the process is different for composers um, because if you were to just study with one teacher, probably you might only have, get stuck in one style, maybe not your own. So, so you are encouraged to study as many um, different uh, composers as possible. And so and I understand we have a trivia uh, winner. So uh, tell us about your inspirations, I mean, you, you had, you know, Henry Miyamura, Craig Young, of course, and, and, and your middle school teachers, but um, the likes of um, Takeo Kudo, Don Womack, Tom Osborne, uh, Byron Yasui, uh, what did they all bring to you? Well, uh, they, wow, every uh, in, in, in the in the time we have, so, um, each, each, each teacher has always given me something to take away. Um, I, I, I know that with, like with, with Tom Obswarn, um, he, I took away how to set text, um, set text for vocal music. I remember uh, performing uh, with Rachel Schutz, one of your work. And yeah. Work. And so um, I'll just, if I go th like f with Don Womack, who you've had on, on the program, uh, I learned a great deal about orchestration from him. If I really wanted something to cut through um, the secrets to, to do that. Um, uh, in for my, my my graduate years, like Bright Sheng, um, up in Michigan, up in Michigan, he would teach me about form. So a lot of uh, not so much the details, but large picture things. And so he's, I did a lot of cutting of music to shorten it and get it down to its essence. The same thing when I worked with Michael Doherty, it was always getting it very clear ideas and making the pieces short, well, not short, but um, uh, concise. Con Purified. Purified, is, I guess, is the great term, is to, you know, what is it, what is the idea, and then to, to strip away the excess fat. <laughs> one more starlight to talk about. Yes. Our last one in August. 
Uh, we will have Gershwin Rhapsody in Blue with Lisa Nakamichi, a former guest of, of Tuning Up, an early guest of Tuning Up, uh, joining us on piano, uh, and Rachmaninoff Symphony No. 2. We're going big uh, here to close out the Sheridan Starlight series. And what else? And the Telling Rooms. This is a, it's a three-movement orchestra piece that's uh, inspired by poetry by uh, three very uh, talented high school then high school students in Maine. Um, so it's, uh, there was a collaboration with the Portland Symphony there and a writing organization called The Telling Room. And so they held a poetry contest statewide in Maine and they asked students to write about color and how the, it could be anything, how they deal with color on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, from that co competition, I received 10 finalists to create a piece, not with any voice, but just kind of an instrumental uh, inspiration, expression of their, of their words, and I chose three. And um, you know, just, I'll just go over one of them, because each, each one of them has a very special way of dealing with color. And the first movement is called The Happiest Color. And if you read the poem, and we'll try to get the poems into the program notes, um, there is no mention of the color but it's, it's through the uh, listing of objects, like an orange, well, that's a color, but a lemon, or the color of the sun, or the color of a skin tone, or the color of a bus, a school bus. You can get the idea of what this color is. And it starts off very happy with memories that are very happy, but slowly there's a tragedy that happens and um, it's a kind of meditation on what uh, our associations, how our associations can uh, change when we're in the presence of that color. And so again, this is from a high school student now, nonetheless. And so I try to you know, translate their poetry and prose into uh, music. Wonderful. Wonderful. Can't wait. Um, Michael, you mentioned something about playability uh, earlier tonight. The truth is that if, you're, if a composer's piece is very complicated, um, if you're a full-time new music performer like Ensemble Intercontemporain in Paris, that's great. But a lot of orchestras, we don't have that much time to rehearse before a concert. Does that factor into the equation in your composition from your experience working with orchestras with conductors, as far as timing, not timing of your piece, but like how much time we have to rehearse, uh, things that you might not have thought about earlier in your career? Yes, yes. So I'm always thinking about time constraints now, um, making sure that everything is very clear, playable, um, and worthwhile for the musicians. Uh, I think in a lot of, uh, uh, this is in a lot of music by younger composers, including a lot of my earlier works. I'd write very difficult things, and the musicians would practice it, but it'd be buried under five layers of counterpoint, and no one would hear it. And so I'm, I'm always thinking about, you know, how long does the, the orchestra have to rehearse? But also, if there's a difficult passage, is it worth for the, the musician to practice it? Is it going to be heard? Mm. Uh, that's important. Uh, Dave, before you take over, I just want to say, so. If all goes well, we'll all be at the Waikiki Shell next week. Uh, I need to uh, give a big, uh, many thanks to, um, to Dave Moss for all the tremendous work you've done um, the last 12 months, but also, of course, to um, try to, to create a beautiful summer season, which is actually part of our 2020 2021 season and so Dave thank you so much for all you the, the work you've done when I mentioned that uh, he's spent 12 hours a day at the office uh, that's not an understatement <laughs> well we've got a, a ways to go and uh, the only way this has been possible is with an incredibly supportive group of musicians uh, with a tremendous board uh, here at the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra and a community that throughout the past 14 months has shown us how important this symphony is uh, to this community and I wish very much that uh, there will be thousands of people at the Waikiki Shell at some point this summer. 
Um, but the only way we can get there is if we get vaccinated and we stay healthy and we keep this virus at bay. Um, and we can do that by putting safe procedures into place. Going to the concert is going to look very different than it ever did in the past. And that's something that we're going to have to learn to adapt to, whether it's the musicians, whether it's uh, wearing a mask when you're outdoors at the Waikiki Shell. Um, these are all things that are part of being able to enjoy music in the current environment. And I am so grateful to be able to work with Michael and the musicians and these tremendous conductors to put this season together. Um, it's going to be unlike anything we've ever experienced before. There's going to be challenges and we'll address them head on. Um, you know, I, I usually, my, my final departing question is what's, what's the future of symphonic music? music? What's the future of the symphony? <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Well, it's there. We talked about it for right the last here. hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's right here. It's red rays. It's telling rooms. Well, you know, I have, I have a, I think what, what the, with the pandemic and everything, it has um, really created an opportunity for reimagining and um, doing the music of today. But also, you know, I have, I have many ideas of how when we talk about combining what is new and what is old. Possibilities are endless. They sure are. And you put the right creative minds in the room and, uh, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. So uh, we could probably carry on for, you know, two or three hours. And I, I hope uh, we'll see more of you. We will be continuing tuning up throughout the summer here. We'll transition more into program notes. So next week uh, we'll be joined by Ray Hatoda uh, and some of our soloists. And Lou. Uh, yes, Lou and Mira, hopefully, if we can get her out of school. Um, and uh, we'll kind of transition this back into program notes and, and continue to have the conversations that have brought us together uh, without music uh, week in and week out. So Iggy, look forward to seeing you at the Shell yes. this week. And Thank you all. To the Hawaii Th Theater. Yes, of course. Thank you to Greg at the Hawaii Theater Center and the entire staff here who has made this possible. We will be back on this stage as yes. well, uh, just as soon as we can be. Um, thank you, and tickets will be available, information will be available on the HSO website, so head on over there, and we will see you next Tuesday at 7 p.m., 7.30, 7.30 p.m. for tuning up with Iggy and Dave. Uh, mahalo for your support, and thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Thank you, Michael.